Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Well, good Friday afternoon to everyone. It is Friday, July the 14th, 2023. It is currently 3.06 p.m. Central Time, and I'm coming to you live from the Theology Central studio located right here in Abilene, Texas, where a few hours ago, dramatically, the Pony Express on a horse come speeding down our street, running down my street, tearing down my street. What, what's the correct word? The, the horse came running down my street with the Pony Express delivery man on its back, and he was yelling, delivery, 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 and well, it finally arrived. Now, I did a broadcast where we just spent about 20 minutes having a little bit of fun, but yes, we have been waiting from this delivery from the Sword of the Lord. They finally sent me the thumb drive of the 2022 Sword National Conference, right? They sent me, remember they sent me the receipt. It's all right over here if I can find it. It's right here. They sent me the 2022 National Sword Conference album MP3 on a thumb drive. Aren't we glad they did that? Yes, they finally sent it to me. I mean, I had to pay what? I think it was almost $20 for everything, $5 for just shipping and handling. But they sent me the audio files. And we have been talking about how we're going to keep up with the Sword National Conference 2023 that believe, that begins on July the 17th. I have the little card they sent me. July the 17th, and it goes from July the 17th to July the 20th, the National Sword Conference at Gospel Light Baptist Church in Walkertown, North Carolina. All right. That's where the conference will be. So uh, we're going to keep up with that 2023 conference. We're going to keep up with it if I said 2022. July the 17th, 2023, Sword National Conference at Walkertown, North Carolina, Gospel Light Baptist Church. We're going to be keeping up with it. It's going to be streaming at swordofthelord.com. We're going to keep up with it just to get insight, just to see what's going on in that world of theology, that independent fundamental Baptist KJV only type theology. We want to just see what's going on there, what they're going to be talking about in 2023. And I thought a good way to prepare us for the 2023 conference is to go back to the 2022 conference and review some of the sermons. So we're going to go back to the 20. 2022 conference. I don't have the dates of the 2022 conference in front of me, but on the very first night, this is what we're going to, re- we're going to review. We're going to review the opening sermon for the 2022 conference. It appears to be based off Psalm 78. It asks a question, something like, can God build a temple, a temple, build a table in the wilderness? In fact, I'm going to open up the file here. Uh, can God furnish A table in the wilderness. Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? That is the question the sermon, I guess, is seeking to answer. Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? We're going to find out. Psalm 78 is the text. This was preached on the opening night of the 2022 Sword National Conference. We're reviewing this, critiquing it, and analyzing it. One, to see what they were focused on in 2022, and to prepare us to see what they are, and to contrast it with what they're going to be focusing on in 2023. Will there be a major change, a major difference? It'll be fun. It'll be interesting. I've got my Bible open to Psalm 78. I've got uh, multiple Bible. I got three Bibles, and um, I don't have my journal and my pencil. It is in my book bag that's right over there. So what I need you to do is drive to the studio. I need you to walk up the stairs, and I need you to hand me my book bag. Right? Okay. No, I'm I'm joking. While we're listening, I'll grab my book bag. Okay, but there you go. Are you ready? Here we go. Sword National Conference 2022. It's been a long wait. It's taken a long time for the Pony Express delivery man to make it here. But now we have it. Let's review. Let's see what we can learn, how we can be challenged and convicted and get a little insight into what was going on in the independent fundamental KJV only world in 2022. Here we go. Turn to. 
Psalm number 78. Psalm number 78 will be my text of choice tonight. Brother Lonnie Moore, always a blessing when he sings, and Brother uh, Terry Lawson and his three sons before that. I was with Brother Terry yesterday all day in his church up here in Reedsville, and uh, they were singing yesterday, and I enjoyed their time together, but we're always glad to have them here as well. Psalm number 78, and I begin reading with verse number 2. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments, and might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright, and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. The children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle. They kept not the covenant of God and refused to walk in his law and forgot his works and his wonders that he had shown them. If you drop down to verse 17. And they sinned yet more against him by provoking the Most High in the wilderness, and they tempted God in their heart by asking meat for their lust. Yea, they spake against God. They said, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? And that last verse asks a question that I want to concentrate on just a little bit tonight. Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? There was a day, it's been a good number of years back now, I did not grow up in the independent Baptist crowd. Okay, so we have a a pretty good setup. I think what's about to take place is instead of really going through the historical context here, maybe getting us an idea of what's going on, I think he's really going to focus on that one phrase, that one idea, Psalm 78, verse 19, yea, they spake against God. They said, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Yea, they spake against God. They said, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Now, I don't know if he's going to take that question in the context that's being provided here, because clearly they're saying this against God. They're saying it almost in a mocking way. Come on, God, can you can you furnish a table in the wilderness? Can you feed us in the almost in a it seems like a negative way, right? Or am I maybe you take it in a different way? I, maybe he's going to deal with that. Or is he just going to take the phrase, can God furnish a table in the wilderness and just kind of go on a topical way. I don't know. We can, we could take predictions right now. Which way is he going to go? Is he going to deal with this? And it's very much, it's historical textual context, or is he going to briefly mention the textual historical context immediately run to a more topical approach and use this as a question, not even really connected with its actual usage in the text. I don't know. We, we can make predictions here. Which, which way, which way we'll take bets. We'll take bets. Put your bets in now. All right. Okay. I'm joking. I'm joking. We're not going to gamble. We're not going to gamble. But I would, I mean, if you want to throw out your prediction and you're listening to me on Spreaker, hop in the chat and throw out your prediction of which way you think he's going to go. All right. Oh, wait, someone, someone said topical approach. All right. If they were wrong, we will publicly humiliate them and mock them for hours and hours and weeks and weeks and months and months and years and years to come. All right. I'm joking. All right. So here we go. I'm curious. I'm curious. Psalm 78. Um, what, what I'm trying to do right now, see, you can't tell that my mind is telling me, how would I approach this text? See, as he's reading it, I'm sitting here going, what would I do with this text? And if someone handed me Psalm 78, 19 and said, this is what you need to preach on this coming Sunday, 
what would I do? That's what I always do when I listen to sermons. How would I handle it? What would I do with it? I mean, I mean, I try to I learn first, but then after the sermon, I'm always asking myself, how would I approach it and what would I do? I don't know what I, I don't know which way I would approach it. I, I, I don't know if I have a, a clear idea in my mind right now, but let's see how they approach it. I was in a convention church, a lot of good people there. But it was a different ball game. I went to a Southern Baptist University. Same time was pastor of a small SBC church. I wound up going to one of their seminaries, liberal inside and out, not knowing any better at the time, even though I knew the difference. <clears throat> but I just thought it was what you had to put up with. And uh, somebody, somebody sent me a copy of the Sword of the Lord and landed in my mailbox. <clears throat> and then another one came and another one came. And I was really responding to it real well and uh, making, making noise as I went and uh, getting a reputation that most guys in that uh, circle don't want the kind of a reputation I was getting. And uh, we, were, we were in Kansas City at the uh, seminary there. And I read in the sword that uh, Dr. Rice and Dr. Hiles were coming to the Blue Ridge Baptist Temple in Kansas City, Missouri, which the seminary was in there, and I was pastor in one of the suburbs of Kansas City, Kansas, across the river. And I said to Betty, I said, you know, I said, uh, they're having a sword conference at the Blue Ridge Baptist Temple, and I'm going to slip off and go over there. Now, I knew better than to let it be known. So I slipped off. Betty and I went, not knowing, not knowing that uh, after, after Dr. Rice had preached, that there would be a little intermediate time where he would get up and ask all of the preachers and the full-time Christian workers to stand up and introduce themselves. And so I thought, oh, my goodness, I, if I don't stand up, that'd be like denying God uh, because I am a preacher. <laughs> and so... I, uh, I, I said, well, I'll stand up. I just won't say it real loud. Uh, you got to remember, I'm in my 20s. I'm, I'm, I'm green behind at least one ear, maybe both of them. And, uh, and so when uh, and I was oh, maybe six or seven rows back right here, directly in front of Dr. John Rice. And, uh, and he was up there, you know, looking down his glasses like he did. And uh, when he got to me, uh, he pointed to me and I said, I'm Shelton Smith. I'm pastor of the Reams Park Southern Baptist Church in Bonner Springs, Kansas. Dr. Rice looked at me and he said, speak up. Young man, I couldn't hear a word you said. <laughs> <laughs> so I blurted it out big and loud. We got in the car to head home. I told Betty, I said, I said, that'll ruin me for sure. But I went back over to the seminary the next morning. There was about 300 students there at the time. There was about 25 of us that they referred to as fundies. Now, what's fascinating about this story is, once again, you see the divisions within Christianity, the, 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 the tribalism, the, the teams, like the colors. Hey, if you're SBC, you don't need to be over there with those independent fundamental Baptists. And if you're hanging out with the independent fundamental Baptists, you don't need to be with the SBC, right? Like there, there was like, you know, they're both Baptists, but one's a Southern Baptist, one's independent fundamental Baptist, and the two shall not meet because the two do have, have nothing in common and you're divided. And one, the at least from my experience in the independent fundamental, fundamental Baptist world, and I went to plenty of their Bible institutes and seminaries, right? Uh, the Southern Baptists are full-blown heretics and it's apostate and their seminaries are apostate, their churches are apostate, they're compromisers, they're liberal, and that you need to come out from among them and be ye separate. Like the first independent fundamental Baptist church I visited in Papillion, Nebraska, found out that I was attending a Southern Baptist church. And right before the pastor left his visitation with us, he gave me the passage that says, come out from among them and be ye separate, touch not the unclean thing, something along those lines. I, I don't remember exactly. It's in what? First Corinthians, second Corinthians. I'm pair of, I may be putting two verses together and basically telling me you get, you, you got to leave them. They're unclean. You, you've you got to get away from them. And um, so you realize immediately, just see the divisiveness and the disagreements and the, 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 
almost tribalism within the body of Christ. Yeah, they, yes, they were that. Yeah, someone said, uh, I didn't realize they were that separate. That's the whole thing about the independent fundamental Baptist world is, is they really emphasize the doctrine of separation. Separate yourself. If the seminaries are liberal, if the seminaries are compromised, I mean, that's the whole really way the independent fundamental Baptist movement began is the threat of higher criticism from Europe and modernism coming in, taking over some of the churches and the seminaries. And are like, now we're not going to stay and fight it. We're going to leave it. We're going to separate ourselves from it. We're going to get away from it. And that's where the, the independent fundamental Baptist movement began to, and then they were, they became very influential and very powerful. And I think this is my own take on church history. If you go back to the original kind of the fundamentals, the fundamental fundamentalists, their real focus was on the fundamentals of the faith. They really were trying to fight the higher, higher criticism coming in from Europe. They really were trying to fight the liberalism and the SBC seminaries. They really were. And they wanted to get to the preaching of God's word and doctrine and, 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 and really there was a, there was something about it. But to me, what it disintegrated into really external self-righteousness and rules about hair and beards and, and, and women not wearing pants and, and, and dress and no earrings. And, and then, and just, it just became like very much like no rock and roll and music and movies. And, and it just became about all of these external things. And it seems like the fundamentals of the faith seemed to over and over get pushed down while these other, what I think what I think needed to be primary was the preaching and teaching of God's word almost became secondary to this external righteousness. And that's where I think the movement had a lot of its problems. And that's where in many cases I felt it disintegrated and fell into straight up legalism to almost cult-like mentality and became very abusive. And if you ever found yourself in it, it at times was very detrimental. The sad part is when they weren't doing that nonsense, when they weren't pursuing that, you really felt like, even though you may have disagreed with them theologically on some issues, right? You, obviously, many of them are very anti-Calvinistic, obviously. You felt like, though, man, they're taking the word of God seriously, and the church is not a social club, and they're really preaching and teaching, and you get an hour-long sermon, and you get a Sunday morning, or you get a Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday, and you and it didn't have a lot of the modern trappings of the church. So there was times you'd be like, so grateful for for that emphasis, but then there, but it would always seem to disintegrate into music, and clothing, and movies, and, and it was like, what is, could we get back to the other and then it would almost disintegrate into that, like a cult-like mentality. And, and so the m movement, I think, has fluctuated a lot over the years. And I think it's lost a lot of its influence. But obviously, they still have the Sword of the Lord National Conference. And so he's drawing some of the contrast. In 2022, he was drawing some of that contrast between the independent world and the Southern Baptist world. Going way back when he was 20 years of age, this, is, this difference has been going on for a very long time. Now, you can figure that out. That was some kind of a pejorative they had created to mock us. And uh, about 25 of us, and I told some of my buddies that were kind of on page where I was, where I had been. So the next night, there was three carloads of us. In fact, several of those guys wind up getting out, too. Now, when I ultimately resigned my church. Now, what's fascinating here is it seems what led him to the fundamental world was the a Sword of the Lord paper. That's why I tell everyone they should read the Sword. Everyone should get a subscription to the Sword of the Lord paper just kind of for its historical significance and leading a, a being a very a voice for really the independent fundamental Baptist world. And a lot of people who picked up the Sword of the Lord paper and reading it in many cases would be led out of maybe the SBC or more liberal denominations or be brought into the fundamentalist world be exposed to it, and then begin to embrace many of its ideas and philosophies. Now, I was not really, I was never exposed to the Sword of the Lord paper until I was already at an independent fundamental Baptist church. Then it was almost like, hey, you're an independent fundamental Baptist? 
you read the sword of the Lord. Like, what are you doing? Like, if you're not reading the sword of the Lord, we have to check your credentials, right? Something is wrong. Right? Everyone has a subscription to the sword of the Lord. In many cases, an independent fundamental Baptist, the church would have a bulk subscription and give everyone you know, the latest uh, edition of the Sword of the Lord paper. So if you've never seen that world or been around that world, you know, looking at, you know, getting a year subscription and just kind of soaking it in for a year, you'll at least get some insight and you'll see what the world looks like in 2023, right? Maybe it may look different than what it was. Now, I think in some, well, we could go into a lot of (laughs) <laughs> we could get into a lot of discussion of the things that's happened in the movement. I, I've always, you know, I was, look, I was very much in the independent fundamental Baptist world. In some ways, I still am because my church is independent. And I still believe we're fundamental because we fight for the fundamentals of the faith. The pre, the inspiration of scripture, the, you know, we, we, we stand for some of those fundamental doctrines. All right, the the uh, you know substitutional substitutionary death of Jesus Christ that we are saved by grace alone through faith alone that there's these fundamental doctrines that we stand with. Now the problem is we we are too. This has always been the problem in my church. We're too Calvinistic, quote unquote, for the independent fundamental Baptist world. So people will then not attend our church because we're too Calvinistic. But then we're not reformed enough for reform people. So then they accuse us of not being really reformed. So we're kind of we're like in no man's land. But that's the thing that you within Christianity you got to pick a side. You got to pick a side. You got to pick a team, and then you got to wear their colors, man. You got to be wearing their colors. And I know I use sometimes the language of like gang warfare, but that's really what it is. You represent your side. You represent your colors. And 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 no 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 no. So for me, they're like, you're not really reformed. Okay. Wait 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 wait. You're one of those Calvinists. Like so, you can't win. Oh, wait, 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 wait. You're easy believism because you don't hold to MacArthur's lordship. Oh, boy. Oh, wait, 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 wait. You, I think you're adding something to the gospel. I think you're, I think you are lordship. Like sometimes like, I get accused of ever, sometimes I'm an antinomian. Sometimes I'm a legalist. Sometimes I'm reform. Sometimes I'm this, sometimes, because every, because nobody seems to understand nuance and layers and the complexities of doctrine and theology and struggle and working through. And people don't seem to understand Understand someone who won't just simply pick a team. I've always said, I'm just going to try to deal with the text and figure it out to the best of my ability. I'm just going to really try my best. But then there's certain parts of being a Baptist that I'm very much historically connected to. The separation of church and state. That was a big thing of the Baptist. I definitely am for that. Autonomy of the local church. I'm definitely for that. And some people don't like that. Some people believe you need a more, some kind of a system of hierarchy. And I, we can get in, we can, into, obviously, I believe in baptism by immersion of someone who's made a profession of faith. That's very much a Baptist thing, right? So, I mean, we, we, there's lots of, we can get into a lot of that. So I always, I always find myself in no man's land, right? I find myself out there in a, and like, then everyone gets mad at you and then you're not welcomed anywhere. So you're not welcomed anywhere. No one likes you, <laughs> yet you just, well, then you end up a very small, small, small church because people want you to do things a certain way, right? You got to do this, you got to do this. And then you add the pol- politics of the American church. You definitely can't win because you know I'm going to reject that out, right? So, yeah. All right, but here we go. To become an independent Baptist, one of the leaders in the convention came to see me. And he told me, he said, if you do this, he said, we'll smear you bad enough you won't ever pastor another church. And I said to him, I said, well, sir, I said, you may do that. But I said, I I hear that they're hard up in the nursing homes and the jails for people to come and preach. And I said, there's street corners all over town where they'll let me get up. So I said, "You, you may pull that off but you're not going to stop me from preaching. But just, just think about that. That kind of stuff happens in Christianity. You leave us, you leave the SBC, we're going to smear you. We're going to make sure you never preach again. That happens in the name of Christ. That happens in the name of Christianity. Yet 
Christians walk around claiming we have supernatural power and we can keep the law and we're all godly. No, that's the kind of ungodliness that goes on behind the scenes and denominationalism and in church. You would be what happens behind the scenes in churches. We're not even talking about immorality, just the, the, the hatefulness and pettiness and fighting and backbiting and gossip and slander and underhanded just stab you in the back. That's how I've, I've often said it when a pa- if a pastor calls me and says, hey, I would like to have dinner with you. I'm always immediately like, oh, what's their play? What's the angle here? They're going to they're going to call me. They're gonna, and guess what? They're going to want to know everything about my church. They're going to want to know the number of people. They're going to want to know what you're doing. And it's almost like they're 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 just doing they're surveying. The, the, the lay of the land, figuring out where and then how they can. And it, and it all I, I've yet to have ever have a pastor call me to f- have lunch. And then it really becomes a friendship. There's no friendship. It's they gather information. You never hear from them again. You never hear from them again. And then in many cases, your people then start going to that church. I've never really had a pastor reach out and say, hey, I'm a pastor in the local area. Hey, we'd like to get together and actually establish a relationship or a friendship. The closest I ever came was with the base chaplain when I was in the Air Force stationed at Dice Air Force Base. That's the closest I ever came to actually feeling like, you know, because but in that case, he's a base chaplain. He's not under any competition or, you know, he. I mean, he's got a, he, he's in the military. He's getting paid his salary from the military to provide spiritual services for the, for the servicemen and women. So it's not the same thing, but everyone else, it's like there's a, there's, it's politics and play. And when, if you ever go to pastors conferences, there's always this networking, right? People getting to know them, looking, and you can almost tell they're looking for different opportunities because you, you trade in your small church for a bigger church. The, the way you work it in ministry is you get to that, you start that little small church where there's no one, and then you, you try to generate excitement and you build it. And once you get to say, say you're, at, you know, 10 people, you can get to that like 70, 80, 100, then Boom, you get out of town fast. You pack up your bags and go because now you can put on your resume that you took a, a, a small church from nothing up to a hundred people and now it's a thriving church. And then you can use that and then boom, now you the next church will already start with a hundred. Now, if you can get, if you can generate some excitement, get that up to around 200, 250, boom, get out of town, get out of town. And you just keep going from church to church to church because it, the long term, yeah, in many cases, it, 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 it goes. Now, for some that can stay in the long term and the church just keeps growing and that's wonderful and great. Usually there's a cycle. There's a life cycle of a pastor. But it's just that kind of crazy stuff. He's going to be, they're going to smear him. They're going to make sure he can never preach again. Like what kind of like, who does that? Like, how, but that's the kind of stuff that happens in the name of Christ. That is just, I, that should depress you and just, and once again, it just make, makes you realize how human and how fleshly a church really is. It's just an institution of sinners. It's fleshly. It's human. There are politics. There is messed up motives. There's people seeking control, backstabbing, gossip, slander. It it is just as much inside the institution of the church as it is any other secular institution. And if you think otherwise, you are naive. Now, that's been a while ago. (laughs) In fact, if it doesn't scare you, I'll tell you, it's been 46 years ago. I left the convention with a wife, two young kids, a dog, a house payment, and a car payment. The Lord fed us. We never missed a meal. We paid our bills on time, and the Lord kept us going. And so, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? I'm exhibit A. Yes, he can. Not only that, but the Lord gave me, and I'd already tasted what we'd all call success. In the ministry. But the Lord gave me the greatest and best days of ministry from that point forward. Many of you know I spent 17 years in Westminster, Maryland, 17 years of absolute miracles. And the Lord blessed with thousands of people saved. 
uh, just more than I can even hardly imagine at this point. Now, here's the question. Psalm 78. Psalm 78. Yet, yea, they spake against God. They said, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? The way he's using it. Is that a correct application or incorrect application? Do you feel that that's a correct usage of that passage? Hey, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? I'm exhibit A. I left the convention. They tried to destroy me. I had a house payment. I had, a, you know, I had bills. I had my wife. I had a dog. And well, we never missed a meal. We paid all of our bills on time because God can furnish a table in the wilderness. So God will take care of you. God will provide that, that the text is meaning that God will provide a table for you. Now, is that, is that a correct application? How many people a day starve to death in our world? Is God not furnishing a table for them? Does it always work out so perfectly and wonderfully for everyone in ministry? I don't, you, let's see. Let's see, see where he's going to go with this. And twenty-seven and a half years ago, when my dear friend Dr. Curtis Hudson went to heaven, and the lot fell upon me to become editor of the Sword. Once again, blessed beyond measure, taking on some responsibility that was a whole new ball game for me. And I testify to you once again after 27 and a half years of the sword of the Lord, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? The answer is yes. Absolutely, positively, without, without equivocation, yes. Now in this passage that I've just read to you, it begins by saying, I'm going to tell you some dark sayings of old. And I think what it means by that is the past generation had received some revelation that some of the current crowd didn't have. And so it's kind of like it's in the closet somewhere. It's in the dark. They haven't been talking about it enough. And so he said, we're going to, we're going to get that out in the open where you can see that because the present generation needs to benefit from the history. Uh, verse 4, he says, don't hide it from your children. I mean, we got stuff already established we're not having to invent everything today. So he said, don't hide these dark sayings from the children. Verse 6, he says, in order that the generation to come might know them. So God had revealed things in the past. And the question is, can God? Yes, God did. Not only that, but he says, don't hide it from your children now. So can God do it now? Yes, God can do it now. And not only that, but he says, make it available to the generation that's yet to come. So will God keep doing it a decade from here, a century from now, until Jesus comes? Yes, God will. Okay, now, all right, I'm looking at Psalm 78. All right. Give ear, O my people, to my law, incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old. All right. I will, uh, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. Now, is this not specifically making references to Israel? What had happened? What they should do? Is, is this about Israel? Now, he's making this very much about us. Now, I'm not, I'm, I'm asking. So, first of all, we need the historical context more than anything. And then second, we have to ask ourselves, how much of this can we rip out of this and make it about us? And just remember, again, the, the, the part about the, the table in the wilderness, yea, they spake against God. They said, can God furnish the table in the wilderness? It's originally asked in a negative way. He's saying, okay, hey, you, you're asking, I'm telling you God can. So if you're asking it in a negative way, I'm telling you God can furnish a table in the wilderness because of what God has done for me in my life because everything in my life worked out. See, I was in a really bad situation and everything went great. I got food, I got money, I got I got ministry, I got success. I got to be the editor of the Sword of the Lord for 20 plus years. Look at how wonderful it all worked out for me. So God, ladies and gentlemen, God will provide a table in the wilderness so it should all work out great and wonderful for you in your life. But 
Does it always work out wonderful and great in your life? I, I, those are questions that I, I want you to ponder and ask yourself and how you would handle Psalm 78. Now, the Lord's greatness was still in evidence in this passage, even though the people did wrong. His greatness was still at <clears throat> the verse, uh, verse 12 that I did not read says, Marvelous things did he in the sight of their fathers. Verse 13, he divided the sea, caused them to pass through, made the waters to stand as an heap. In the daytime, he led them with a cloud, in the night with a light of fire. He clave the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink as out of the great depths. He brought streams also out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. The Lord's greatness was not thwarted because that the people were out of fellowship with him. Now, let's just make sure we get a couple of things straight historically. Those things happen. I believe there were actual events. They happened literal historical they're not happening today, okay? This was a one-time thing. So you got to be careful if you say, well, see, God did those kinds of miracles. So that means he has to do some kind of thing like that for us. Well, no, it means that this is how he worked in the life of Israel, right? What can I take from this? Uh, let, let's just continue. God was still God even when the people were walking wrong. And the Lord does not evolve from one generation to the next. Verse 5, he said, he, he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel which he commanded our fathers, our fathers, that's then and now, that they should make them known to their children. That's then and verse 6 to the generation yet to come. That's then. So the next generation needs to understand the Lord will not evolve for their convenience or for their comfort. <clears throat> he does not do that. The new generations, however, often copy and repeat the tragedies of the past. Children of Ethereum, they were well trained. They had been to the University of Humanism. They had, they had been exposed to the Internet and all these various things. You understand? But yet, having all of the advantage that they had, all of the prep, all of the training, all of the exposure, yet they kept not the covenant of God, and they refused. They deliberately made choices to refuse to walk in His law and forgot His works and His wonders that He had already shown them. Now, the question would be, this is the story of the Old Testament. It happens over and over and over. Now, we've been talking about this in our study of Jeremiah over and over and over. Failure, 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 sin, 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 sin. Which to me, the only way to even try to come close to even dealing with this is that once again, it demonstrates life under the law. Life under the law is a continual state of disobedience and sin and failure because man cannot keep the law. None of us can keep Keep the law. Saved or lost, we cannot keep the law. We always fall short. We're in a perpetual state of sin. That's why our only hope is in the imputed righteousness of Christ. That's why we're saved by an imputed righteousness, not an infused righteousness. And we could go on and on and on and talk about that. So I, I understand that he's talking about all of their sin, but Okay, let's just see where he goes. Let's just see where he goes. Obviously, he wants to make this about us. He wants this to make about uh, about us and not about the original context. Now, the question is, how much from the context, how much from the historical setting can we rip and take and then apply to us? And if we applied it to us, what would be the application? What would be a, a fair application of Psalm 78 for your life and my life? That's something I want you to think about and see if you can articulate. By all means, grab a notebook and start working on it. They were not in the dark. They were not blinded. They had seen the hand of God, and yet they would not go with him. And so it's not surprising that when we get down to this 19th verse, they're looking to the right, they're looking to the left. They're looking up, they're looking down. 
They are standing on their head till their ears are turning red. And they're saying, what are we going to do? Can God furnish a table in this wilderness where we are? They're frustrated and in doubt they're crying out. And almost mocking God and saying, do you think God can do something about this? Do you think it's possible that in our time that God could actually put a table for us in the midst of the wilderness? Out in the wilderness where there is no garden, there are no great wheat fields, no great corn fields. It is barren, desolate. Can God do that? Well, the answer needs to be God did. And God will, God can, and he will. Now, obvious their circumstances were pretty desperate. Out there in the wilderness, a place beset with snares and predators and other dangers. Just making your way through the desert on a freeway, you'll, you'll see all kinds of things that give you indication you don't want to have a breakdown. Until you get to some place where there's an oasis. Get to the New Testament time. Many of the Christians were thrown into prison. They were whipped and other things to bring them hurt. Great persecution. And here you and I live in the 21st century. And we, we face some pressure. We face some times when we're getting orders from headquarters somewhere. Uh, the state capitol or Washington, D.C. or someplace. Uh, getting some persecution. Uh, There are people sitting all over this room. I'm not asking you to stand up and testify, but I know there are people in this room, you've been betrayed, and it's been recent times. Things have gone sour in your life. You've gotten hurt. You've had days that have been so long you thought they would never end. And you may have asked yourself, can God do anything about this? And I answer my question again. God did, God can, and God will. Oh, this kind of preaching, it, it sounds so spiritual and so godly and so encouraging. You've been betrayed. You've been hurt. You've been let down. You're at the end of your rope. Hey, can God provide a table in the wilderness for you? He has. He can. He will. Comfort is coming. But the context here is... Look literally, behold, he smote the rock that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide flesh for his people? Like the literally, this is talking about the things God did literally in the wilderness for Israel. And he's taking it, kind of making it more metaphorical, right? He's trying to make it more allegorical. Now, he's not denying the historical reality, but he's leaving the historical reality going, well, God did that in a literal way. Hey, so God can do something for us today. Well, if God is going to provide food and water for people today, maybe he could first and foremost, instead of taking care of me because I had a rough day or I feel like I'm facing persecution or someone betrayed me, maybe instead of trying to help me out like that, he could build an actual table in the wilderness so that people would stop dying of thirst and starvation because thousands die every single day in our world from starvation and a lack of clean drinking water. So like, like if, like, if you're going to try to apply this, well then let's apply it. God feed the hungry, take care of them. Um, Okay, yes, someone said God, he said God will do these things. He's like, makes no sense as he is acknowledging all these difficulties people have been going through. So what gets God to do it, right? Like he's saying God will do it, but there's situations where God did, did God in a sense make a table in the wilderness for John the Baptist? No, he lost his head. Like, so there's times God seems to intervene and there's times God doesn't seem to intervene. So you can't say God will do it, right? You could say God can, but even if you say God can, you're taking the literal, in a sense, making a table in the wilderness, literally feeding people manna, all the different ways he fed them, water from a rock, all the miraculous ways that he fed them. And then you're saying, okay, now God's going to step in, but he's only going to step in to give, I guess, give you encouragement or to give you a better ministry or like he's going to pay your bills. Well, wait a minute. There's literally people starving to death. So why is he just raining manna down so that people don't starve to death? 
Like, it's it's just such a weird, it's, it seems to me so disrespectful to take these actual gigantic miracles and then just say, well, God will do something similar for you. I mean, he's not going to do it that way because he doesn't do it that way now, but he's going to do something. And the way I know he's going to do something, and I'm going to guarantee it, is because, well, I left the SBC, they were going to smear my name, and look at how great my ministry turned out. I've had success after success. I'm now a conference speaker. I've been an editor of the Sword of the Lord for 20-something years. Look at how I've, I've, all my bills have been paid. I've not missed a meal. Look at how great it worked out for me. Well, how great does it always work out for believers in China? Or how great does it work out for believers on the continent of Africa? In certain regions of Africa? Or in North Korea? All right, let's see where, how, where he takes this. Now, these folks, in their carnality... I mean, things were going really crazy with them. They were not behaving. So much so, you get over to verse 35, 36, 37. It says, oh, they remembered that God was their rock. They, they knew who God was. They knew what he could do. They knew that the high God was their redeemer. Nevertheless, they did flatter him with their mouth and lied unto him with their tongues, for their heart was not right, neither were they steadfast in his covenant. They, they knew who God was. They knew what he was about. But it's like, well, we're going to do our thing. We've got our own ideas. And we're going to do what we want to do. And so they did that. And consequently, the roof caves in. And they find themselves with throwing up their hands and saying, oh, do you think, really, do you think God can do anything about this? And the answer is yes, he obviously can. Now, when others can't, God can. He can do it in your town just like he does it in somebody else's town. In the past, God did. I believe he can today, and I believe he will tomorrow. I spent 34 years as a pastor, and these 27 years at the sword have not been without dealing with a lot of people. I've seen a lot of broken families. I've seen a lot of families in such desperate straits. They were throwing up their hands and saying, there's no use. We can't go on. And you know what I've been privileged to say over and over again? But God. What he did do, he can do. And if you let him do what he can do, he will do it. It's, to me, it's such a, a bait and switch. Hey, look at what God did in the past. You read about all these amazing miracles and, and parting the Red Sea and feeding water from a rock and feeding people in the wilderness and leading them uh, with a cloud and a night with a light of fire and, and all of these great things that he did. And you say, well, see, God did those things in the past, but God will do those things in the press. I mean, wait, 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 wait. He'll do those things in the press. Not those things. Not those things. He's not going to literally feed people. People. He's not literally going to part the Red Sea. He's not going to literally do. He's not going to literally guide us. He's not going to literally do any. Of the, but he's going to do those things. I mean, maybe because obviously he doesn't do it for everyone. I mean, like so, like it, it's just uh, you preach it in a way like it's so encouraging. Like, okay, God's going to build that table in the wilderness for me, and that means my ministry. I'm going to get a better ministry. That means I'm going to get more money. That means uh, my my cancer is going to go away. Uh, someone just said, he just said, if we will let him, then he will do it. So apparently we prefer, okay, that's a, oh, that's a good catch. I didn't even catch that. Yeah, so I guess the issue is we have to let him, right? If we will let him, if we will let him. So am I the one preventing it? So do is God going to, you know, my church is small. You know, my, my podcast is small. Okay, maybe, maybe if God, if I will let God, he'll build a table in the wilderness. Man, my ministry will go to about you know, 100 people. Podcasts will grow. Money will come in. Man, it's going to be all, like, 
Or am, am I not letting him? I don't know how many people are like, God, uh, you know, nope, nope, don't help me out here. Nope, I don't want any food. I don't want any money. I don't want a better ministry. I, I, don't want, I don't want to make my life better. I don't want my family to get better. I don't want my situation to get better. Because earlier, it sounds like he said that God did these things while the people were fleshly, while the people were not in fellowship with him. Earlier in the sermon, he seemed to imply that God did these things for the people when they were not in right fellowship with him. Now it seems to imply if we let him. So I don't know which, I don't know which it is. Many bitter, broken hearts. Folks that just got all kinds of things stirring down deep inside of them. What do you do about that? Well, everybody thinks you need a psychiatrist or you need a psychologist. Well, you, you need to know the great physician. Because he's the one who did, he can, and he will. We have to deal with homeless people. Now, wait a minute. Is Psalm 78 telling you that you have mental health issues that may require a psychologist? Right? Uh, Are you telling me that, you know, mental health counseling, mental health, that you don't need that? You just need the great physician. If you have mental health issues, you don't need a psychiatrist. You don't need a, psycho- a psychologist. You don't need that. You just need the great physician. Whoa, whoa, slow down there. Because that's like telling me if someone has cancer, they don't need, you know, they don't need, they don't need a specialist. They need the great physician. You got to be careful with that. that. That's all. I always get so upset when that happens in Christianity. If you have any mental health issues, you just need the great physician. You need God. Whoa, that mental health issue. That's a health issue just like any other disease. I got no problem saying you, you, you need your, your Christianity can be a part of it and it can be an instrumental part of that and making sure you're looking at things from a spiritual standpoint. But Psalm 78 is by no means saying if you if you think if you're if you're if you're down, you don't need a you know, Psalm 78 is saying you don't need a psychologist, you don't need a psychiatrist. It's not saying that. It's not saying that in any way, shape, or form. Some of them not only homeless, but they're pretty helpless as well. What can you do to bring them out of the abyss where they live? You can tell them there is a God in heaven who has helped folks all through the years. He will do it now. He will keep doing that. We find folks soaked in alcohol and drink. So if I go to a homeless person and tell them about Christ, God will help them out of their homelessness? 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 It's becoming a Christian. And God just fixes all of those financial issues, debt, what? I no, I'm not, by all means, they should come to Christ. Obviously, it can't hurt. I just don't know if your homelessness will just immediately go away. Driven by drugs, is there any hope for them? Absolutely. Let them come in the door. Let them come in. Get hold of what God can do for them. He'll drain the bottle. He'll stop the drugs. Thugs come through the door with long rap sheets. So if you come to Christ, immediately your addiction is gone? Doesn't work that way. Sometimes it does, but not always. Because again, if you just take it to a logical conclusion, if someone who's a drug addict becomes a Christian and miraculously the drug addiction goes away, meaning God can just completely make it go away, then why when everyone becomes a Christian, miraculously, we just don't stop. We, uh, miraculously, we won't just stop sinning. Uh, that sound was an update on a heat advisory because it's 112 or whatever the thing is telling me right now. So, all right, scared me to death. I almost fell out of my chair. But all right, the the point is that if you say that, hey, if you have this problem, you come to God and miraculously it's gone. He'll drain the bottle in the drug addiction, gone. Well, then when you become a Christian, boom, you should stop whatever your issue is, whatever sin is. So therefore we should all be sent. Once again, Christianity constantly preaches this idea that if you come to Christ and say that the imputed righteousness, just please note, this is not coming to Christ 
to be saved from your sin with imputed righteousness. This is coming to Christ and you won't need a psychologist. You won't need a psychiatrist. You, your homelessness, you will no longer be homeless. You will no longer be an alcoholic. You'll no longer be a drug addict. This is coming to Christ for practical benefit. This has come to Christ for practical benefit. We come to Christ because we're sinners and we need an imputed and alien righteousness. But it's always preached, forget the, because the imputed righteousness, that's not so exciting. But come to Christ and dun, 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 forget imputed righteousness. You get this. And it says, oh, and it always is, almost sounds like an infused righteousness, which is directly Roman Catholicism. I don't know. All right. You say, what do you do? We welcome them just like we did Saul of Tarsus. And realize that the God who is the miracle working God can do for them what he's done for the souls of the world. We've seen mafia members, sexual. The souls of the world who become a Paul who says the things I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, I keep doing. And with my mind, I'll serve the law of God. But with my flesh, I'm going to continue to serve the law of sin. How come that always gets forgotten? How come that always forgets just left out? That just, we just leave that out of the story. Deviants, crooks, thieves, all kinds of dishonest characters. God gets hold of them and do for them what he's done for others and what he keeps doing for those who come to him. Yeah. Hey, you come to God and it'll all be fixed. I mean, you know, nowhere in the world would Christians tell you if you leave their denomination that they're going to slander you and smear you so that, oh, wait, you started your entire sermon by talking. Oh, but I guess those people aren't saved. You talk about the pastor, some of the pastors sitting there who've been stabbed in the back and betrayed. Oh, that would never happen in the church because, I mean, come on. When, when, once you become a Christian, everything in the church should be good. Oh, but anyone who does anything bad in the church, I guess, is not a Christian. But the church is made up of all kinds of deviant, backhanded, messed up behavior is just as prevalent in the church as it is anywhere. May not be as external but it's still there. It may be of a different type, but it's still there. And you know, the things that seem to be impossible with God, without God, things that are seemingly impossible with men are altogether possible with God. In Genesis chapter 6, we read about a man named Noah. The world had gotten in a mess. But Noah and Mrs. Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth and Mrs. Shem, Mrs. Ham, Mrs. Japheth, the eight of them, they were, they were plowing a straight row, living right, doing what they should, walking with God. God called out and he said, I want you to build an ark. They had never seen it rain, but God said there's going to be a flood. And whatever God said in that uh, time, uh, Noah pitched in and began to do what he had been ordered to do. And he discovered that God was able and that he would do what he had said. A little later, we read about in the same in the the book of Genesis, we read about a man named Joseph, one of my favorite Old Testament characters. Joseph, the one they called the dreamer. Oh, when everything, uh, you know, uh, is going against him. I mean, he winds up in the pit. He winds up in prison, ultimately in the palace down in, in uh, Egypt and all these things. I mean, everything, it just seems like he gets going well and something sours and he winds up in trouble. And yet, blessed Joseph, he keeps saying, God will, God will, God can, God will do it. He'll... The Bible says the Lord was with Joseph every step. God didn't impose himself on Joseph, but Joseph allowed God to be there. Later we read about a man named Moses. Moses said, oh, they they won't believe that you've spoken to me. I mean, I I have a speech impediment. They, they, They won't believe that I'm supposed to talk to them. God said, what's that in your hand? You say, what did he do with that rod? He demonstrated to Moses that the God who had been the God of, of Joseph and the God of Noah and others, that he who had done things in the past could do them now. And he demonstrated that to, to Moses in un, 
real fashion. So you're, you're getting the idea here. We're not going to learn anything about Psalm 78, okay? You're getting an idea. So really, this sermon is presenting us, though, a kind of a theological dilemma, kind of a, kind of a, a, a almost a, a hermeneutical dilemma. When we read of God's miraculous actions in the past, the parting of the Red Sea, manna, water from the rock, all of these miraculous signs and wonders, healings, miracles. When we read of all of those miraculous things of the past, how do we apply them? How do we carry them over to the present? Now, some people... You really have, if you think about the church, you really have two camps. You got the one camp that said, the miracles God did in the past, he is doing today. He is raising people from the dead. He is healing people. He is curing diseases. He's do, like, and they look for the miraculous and they always have stories of this and this person. And, and there was a village here and five people were raised from the dead. And this person was cured of leprosy and this person had cancer and this person couldn't walk and now they can't. And they got stories and stories and stories and stories and stories constantly of healings and miracles and healings and miracles and healings and miracles. And everyone there believes healing is guaranteed in the atonement for the here and now. That is the charismatic world. They see the miraculous signs of, and they believe God could, you know, that you can go outside and in the name of Jesus, speak to a hurricane and make it stop, speak to a tornado and make it go away. Like they've got all, and the stories sometimes get bigger and crazier, but that, that camp, the charismatic camp, they say, I look at the stories of the past and I apply them to the present in a literal way. God can do the exact same things now. I'm surprised they're not, they're not trying to walk on water. Who knows? Who knows what they're trying to do? The, the, you always hear the stories. That's the charismatic world. The other camp says, God did all of those miraculous things in the past and the way I apply them in the present is not that, well, God's going to feed people, you know, with manna, not that water's going to come out of a rock. So he's not going to be, no, no, but he can do miraculous things in, in a, and in a more normal way. Like, it's like God doing supernatural things for you, but in not such a dramatic way, right? So you, people aren't going to be necessarily raised from the dead, and there's going to be healings and all of these kind of miracles, but God will make sure your bills are paid, or you will get food, or or your ministry. If things are going bad, God's going to put a table in the wilderness. He's going to take, they try to find a way to say, well, God can do these things. Now, he won't do them the exact same way, but he'll do them in a kind of a less supernatural way or a less less sensational way. They still find some way to apply it or pull it over. So for you, when you read of these, all of the miracles and wonders that God does, say in Psalm 78 or wherever, um, what do you do with it? How do you apply it to your life? How do you apply it? How do you apply it? You get a call from the doctor that you need to come in for your results. And they're like, uh, I'm sorry to tell you, you have terminal cancer. You got six months to a year to live. Do you apply that as, well, then God will heal me because God can do miraculous things. You get a anthrax injection on a Friday at about 4 p.m. as you're about to get off work. And 72 hours later, they're calling a code blue and you're about to die and now you have a seizure disorder. Do you say, well, hey, 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 you, God, God's going to fix it. You're in some kind of an accident. And now you're paralyzed. Well, God's going to fix it. Like, like, how do you, how do you, how do you do that? Well, man, I'm having trouble financially. Hey, God can provide a table in the wilderness. He's going to make sure the money comes in. I'm going to have food. He's going to take care. Man, my ministry. I don't know. I think I'm trying to stand for God's word. I'm trying to preach it. I keep losing people. God's going to provide a table in the wilderness. The time is coming that my ministry will grow. And like, do, do, where do you apply it? What, what's the correct hermeneutical way of handling the... Now, first and foremost, I think the first hermeneutical way to handle it, I'll just throw out some suggestions, is obviously it was 
It's descriptive. It's not prescriptive. It's describing what God did for them. It's not prescribing any guarantee or promise that God's going to do that for you. The miracle God does for us is to save us from our sin by the imputed righteousness of Christ. That's the miracle. That's what Christianity is about. We read these stories of God's involvement in different ways at different times, but it's descriptive. You got to be very careful. He's almost making it prescriptive that God is prescribing exactly. He will do similar, not the exact. See, he's very careful not to say, well, God's not going to feed the homeless. God's not going to, you know, he's he's, he's changing the miracles up, but God's still going to do something. Later, a young man named Joshua would be selected to be the successor to Moses. I don't know if you could hear someone in the background saying, this is good. Is it? Is this good? I don't know. I I still don't understand Psalm 78, and you're really presenting me a major theological and hermeneutical issue of what I do with these things. And you're not giving me any hermeneutical or textual ideas and what I do with these. You're just making it sound like God will do this for you. If you're here today and you're broken and you're discouraged and you're hurt and things are not good, God will provide a table in the wilderness for you. And I can see someone writing that down in their journal. All right. Oh, yes. All right. Yeah, things are so bad, but God's going to provide a table for me in the wilderness. But, but he's almost basically said, hey, you know, if you've got mental health issues, you don't need a psychologist. You don't need a psychiatrist. You just need the great physician and God's going to take care of all your pro-. This is This to me is setting people up for the major letdown. That, that's just my own personal feelings. I can just imagine that Joshua, Joshua was shaking in his sandals. I mean, he... he I mean, to imagine that he was going to follow the the great Moses. And yet God said to him, every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto thee. You say, what was he saying? He was simply telling him that what he had done, he would do and he would keep on doing. Covenant promises specifically for, come on class, Israel. Right. Then there was a man, First Kings 18 tells us about a man named Elijah. Elijah was a faithful man of God. He was outnumbered by a uh, large group, uh, 850 or so of those false prophets uh, on Jezebel's payroll. And, uh, and yet he stood, yet he did what he was supposed to do. Why? He believed that God had, that he would, and that he would see him through, and he did. Shortly thereafter, there was a young man came on to follow him, a young man named Elisha. And he said, I just want twice what Elijah had. I think he probably knew he wasn't made out of the kind of stuff that would enable him to do what he was needing to do unless he had twice what Elijah had from God. But God blessed him and gave it to him. I read about a man named Job who lost everything he had. Lost his fortune, lost his family, but not his faith. And because he maintained his faith, he said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. So with his faith, he said, I know that my Redeemer lives and on the earth again shall stand. I read in 1 Samuel 17 about a boy named David, a shepherd boy who faced the giant when others quaked in fear. But he went to battle with him and God used him. I think about Isaiah who said, here am I, send me, and God did. I think about Jeremiah whose heart burned deep within him Down in his bones, there was a fire burning in the midst of a nation that was going awry, going sour. And yet his broken hearted prophet had the burning of the fire of God deep in his soul because he knew that God could do what he had done in the past. Daniel and the three Hebrew children, Hosea whose world came crashing down on him, John the Baptist, Simon Peter, Saul of Tarsus, on and on the list could go. 
And what I'm saying to us tonight, when the river is wide, just remember, God can. He has, he can, and he will. When the desert is scorching, just remember, God can. When the enemy plunders in at your place and does great destruction, remember, God can. When your heart is cut so deep that you think you'll bleed to death, remember, God can furnish that table for you just like he has for others. When the light grows dim, God can. When the authorities press hard, God can. When the pandemic strikes, God can. When the streets are rife with, with violence, God still can. When liquor floods like a raging stream down the streets of your city, God can. When babies are being slaughtered, God can. When perverts are hugging the cameras, God still can. God can, but he let all of those things happen. Like, I, I, I don't know. It, I, it's, it, it, it sounds so good. Like, God can, God can, God can, God can, God can, God can. That, that preach is so good, but he, he's basing it off what God did for Israel in limited situations and then flipping it where, well, God will do something similar, but not just like that, right? He's just taking the concept that God can and well, well, God, you can say God can, but then you, you name a lot of these horrible situations and you're like, well, then where's God? When violence, how long, look at the, the life, the entire history of humankind. Look at how many people have died, either murder or war. Look how many babies have been aborted and will still be aborted in some way, shape, or form, even though things have changed. Still, different states are going to do different ways. Still, they're, they're going to they're going to still, and who knows, at some point it will probably overturn and go back to the way Roe v. Wade had it. I, I'm I'm almost guaranteed that whatever victory we're having over abortion now will only be temporary. That's my my own, own take. Just think of all the thing, all of the the perversions of the present. There were perversions in the past. You ever read? I don't know the Bible. So I'm like, so God's going to provide a table in the wilderness. But all of these things, the violence, the perversion, all of these are just going to continue on. In fact, depending on your eschatology, they're only going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. So when you say God can't, what do you mean? God, if God, well, I'm not saying God can't, but what do you, when you say God can, you're almost making a guarantee that he's going to somehow stop all of that. Or you saying, no, all of those things are going, but you will have a table in the wilderness, meaning that, if, that it won't impact you. Like, I don't know. But then you talked about all the horrible things that happened to some of God's people. So I don't really know exactly what it means that God can. When uh, fentanyl kills 100,000 people a year in this country as it has in the last couple of years, just remember God can. When God can what? Stop the people from dying? Resurrect them? Re that, okay, someone said the real question, did God say he would? And if so, what's the explanation for all the bad uh, to Christians? And also, is that really what the text is saying? I can and I will pay your bills, but sorry, it hasn't happened for you yet. But for me, it did. Like, yeah, I don't, I don't really know. One, I don't know what the text is saying, but you, it really raises all of these other questions. Did God ever say that I'm going to take care of these problems? And 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 then what about all of the cases where he's not? I mean, you just mentioned 100,000 people dying of fentanyl. Okay, well, they're dead. <laughs> they're, they're dead. So God can. God can what? Watch them die? Like, I don't, what, do, what do you mean? I don't understand what that means. Hey, hey, they're dead, but God's got a table for you. So that means you won't die? Like, I, 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 how does that work? And the networks are deliberate in their deception. God still can. When educate the educ 
the network's deliberate in the deception. How about the church and its deceptions? Okay, but all right. But the networks are going to deceive. But God can. God can what? Stop the network? I, I, I don't understand what this means. It, it, it's supposed to be a rallying. Or like, you know, he's trying to rally everyone. Like, a, like almost a pep rally. Everyone stand up. God can. Yay! I'm going to leave here. God's going to make a table in the wilderness for me. And he's going to do, I, I don't know, but he's going to do something for me. He's going to pay my bills. He's going to give me a better ministry. He's going to, I, 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 I don't know. He's going to do it. I know. I know. I don't really know why, but he's going to do it because, because he can. Educational arena falls into the hands of the weirdos. Remember, God can. When you start a new church, God has, he can, he will. When you start running buses, God can. When you knock on doors, God can. You refuse to Calvinize. You refuse to contemporize. You You refuse to Calvinize. He's talking about Calvinism. He's talking about Calvinism. In other words, if you refuse to do these things, God can't. Your church is going to be wonderful. Your church is going to grow. But there's many churches who did not Calvinize who no longer exist. There's churches that Calvinized, who no longer exist. Churches collapse and fall apart and cease to exist and pastors quit and churches split all the time. Refuse to charismatize. God can, God can, God can. And when you stand up to be counted, whatever the issue, large or small, Whatever the crowd, large or small, when you stand up to be counted, the God who did can and he will. When you give it your best and it doesn't seem to be enough, just remember he can. Whenever you give no place to discouragement, it gives full opportunity for the God who can to do what he can do. Someone just said, uh, oh, that that's explains why I'm having trouble with things. I Calvinized, right. But, but see, what's weird is the early part of the sermon was that God did all of these things even when they were out of fellowship with God. Even when the people weren't right, God still did. He still led them by the pillar of cloud and the fire. He still fed them from, uh, gave them drink from the rock. He still fed them the manna. He still did all of these miracles, even when they were out of fellowship. So then it has nothing to do with whether I Calvinize or don't Calvinize. God can. Whether I'm faithful or not faithful, God can. Okay, so I guess that's, but see that someone just says, so then when he doesn't, it's my fault. It seems to imply that when he doesn't, it is my fault. But earlier in the sermon, he clearly expressed that God did these things mentioned in Psalm Psalm 78, these miracles, when the people were out of fellowship with him, meaning that God can even when I don't. But then he seems to imply that it's based on what I do or do. I don't know anymore. I don't just... I guess I'm just supposed to say, God can. I'm supposed to stand up and hold my Bible and say, Amen! God can! And just get all excited like I'm at a pep rally, I guess. I don't, I don't know. I, but I still don't understand Psalm 78, and I still don't know the correct way to apply the miracles of the past to the present. Do I look for them to happen in a literal way, just like they did? Or do I take them and kind of say, well, I mean, God did. He parted the Red Sea. I mean, he's not going to part the Red Sea anymore, but he'll make sure I can pay my bills. Like, is that is that the correlation? I like that's really the theological question we're being left with, and the hermeneutical question. When you refuse to quit, even when others want you to quit, just remember, God can furnish a table for you. You may be in a wilderness, you may be in a desert place, you may be in some place where nobody has any idea who you are or what you're about, and you may have everybody in town looking like they're not your friend anymore. But I want you to know when this question is raised in the Bible by folks I think who are just kind of mocking the question, and they say, can God, (laughs) do you think God can furnish a table? I mean, in this place, I mean, where I am, do you think God can do that for us? And I want to say it in a whisper, yes. And I want to say it in a shout, yes. 
whether low volume or high, the answer to that question is God did it. He did it for the generation past us, the generation before that, and a bunch of generations prior to that. They had revelation. They left us a heritage. They left us a legacy. We don't have to reinvent things. We've got the answer, and we need to just declare it. God did. God can now. And next year, decade from now, century from now, should Jesus tarry his coming, he still will. Dear Lord in heaven, I pray tonight. There you have it. That was the opening message of the 2022 National Sword Conference. The 2023 National Sword Conference begins on July. I keep thinking I say June. Hopefully I'm not. July the 17th. It will be live streamed at swordofthelord.com. You should watch it and compare the opening message this year to last year's opening message, which we just reviewed, critiqued, and analyzed. The theological question, even though I don't, I, I did not learn anything about Psalm 78, and I don't, I'm very frustrated with a lot of the philosophical implications that arise from that, because you really have to say, well, then why God, why does God not do anything? I'm just going to set all of that aside. The question I want you to wrestle with, and I, and I really want you to wrestle with it, that, that's, that's always the goal of whenever I listen to a sermon, no matter how much I disagree with it, how much I may dislike it, I always try to take something from it that I can chew on, I can do something with. And this presents me a huge problem. We have all of these miracles recorded in the Bible, these miraculous miracles, right? Where God does these miraculous things. There's so many times I can remember my, my, and, and my Christian life where I'm like, God, look, you parted the Red Sea. You fed the people. You led them through the wilderness. You did this. Their clothes did not wear out. All of these just miraculous thing after miraculous thing. Yeah. You, you helped them, you know, destroy Jericho and all of these things that, that he did. Miracle after miracle after miracle. I'm like, God, I don't need anything that big. I don't need it. I just need, I don't know, a hundred thousand dollars to pay off my mortgage. That's it. I just need just, just a hundred thousand. I mean, I just, that's all I need. You just send a check. That's all I need. That's all I need. Just, just take care of that. Oh Lord. Oh man. I got this never ending problem with seizures and epilepsy because of, of what happened to me in the military. Lord, could you do something? You know, whatever the case may be, there's always these little, and you know, God, I don't need a, a, a massive miracle. I just need maybe four or five more new families to join the church, four or five more new families that will attend all the services and support the ministry. That would be great. Lord, you know, all, you know, all I need is if I had, if I had like, I don't know, if, if, if every listener would just send $1 a month to the, to the internet ministry, then I would know the internet ministry would be, pr pr I would not have to ever worry about anything. Everything would be paid for $1 a month by everyone who listens. My goodness, we would be, we'd be, we would be, we would be so good. We, we, we could improve. I, I would have to never worry about anything. Like I, I don't need some, I don't need like, a, a mil, I don't, I'm not asking for a million dollars. I'm just asking for this or this or this little, or, or a little bit of money here so that I could fix this or I could do this or I could I could fix my fence or or you know, whatever the case, whatever little things and then but those things don't happen so I I know I I struggle with reading those things and going God I look I don't look you did this I don't need that I don't need fire from heaven I don't need the parting of the Red Sea I need a little thing compared to that and then you're like well am I is that selfish is that fleshly and so is that why God won't do it like then you have those struggles. So the question is, when you read of those miracles of the past, what have you, how have you handled them in your Christian life? Have there, has there, have you, now depending, some of you may be from a charismatic background and you're like, well, I want to see people raised from the dead. I want to see these healings. Like you may, or may you even convince that they were happening. I, I've never been in that camp where I'm looking for like a literal, tra literal same, rep, you know, repeating of the miracles. I've been more in the camp, well, God did those things so he can do similar things for me, right? Like maybe not the same way. So how do we translate? How do we apply them? How do they, how, what do we do with them? And I think the first question is, I think in many of these passages, there's not even a hint that it's for me. It's simply describing what happened then. It's not prescribing anything. There's no hint of a promise for me that God will do anything even, even close in a similar way. 
What, what the, 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 the focus seems to be is you are a sinner and God provided miraculously for you in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And by faith, his righteousness is imputed to you. And now you're declared to be perfect and holy. There's no, I don't see that I can take any of those tangible miracles done and say, now God's going to do this for me or provide for me or do this or do this or do this or do this. But you can struggle with it yourself. All right, there you go. It was a little bit of fun, a little bit of frustrating, a little bit of frustration. I was hoping to get more like really work on Psalm 78, right? Like who, what, where, when, how? What, like what, how do we, how should we preach Psalm 78? Spend some time on Psalm 78. How would you outline the chapter and how would you preach it? All right, newsif at yahoo.com. Love to get all your feedback and thoughts. Thank you very much for listening to another extremely long sermon review because they're always long. Again, we just reviewed the opening message for the SWORD National Conference 2022 to get us prepared for the upcoming National SWORD Conference of 2023 that begins on July the 17th. And it will be live streamed at swordofthelord.org or swordofthelord.com. I keep saying O-R-G. All right, thanks for listening. Have a great day. God bless.